Hello, I'm Father Timothy Matkin from St. Francis Anglican Church in Dallas with the Rector's Report. Today I'm considering the question, what is wrong with the 2019 Book of Common Prayer? Well, before I get too far into that, let me say not a whole lot. I mean, I might tweak a few things here and there about it, but this might be one of the best Anglican prayer books out there. I really commend the drafting committee for their work. However, there is one thing that needs to be corrected, and it, it's not the typo on the table of contents. Yes, that is really there, and I'm sure it will be fixed. That pales in comparison to the problem that I'm talking about. Frankly, I'd rather have a hundred typos in this book than one bad rubric, and that's what we need to deal with. There's a rubric or direction in the additional directions section following the Eucharistic Rite, it's on page 141, that gives permission for excess quantities of the consecrated wine to be poured out rather than consumed after the consecration and communion. So let's take a look at the text of that rubric here. If any consecrated bread or wine remains after the communion, it shall be set aside in a safe place for future reception. Apart from that which is to be set aside, the priest or deacon and other communicants reverently consume the remaining consecrated bread, either after the ministration of communion or after the dismissal. The wine shall likewise be consumed or reverently poured in a place set aside for that purpose. Now you should know that this is a slightly improved version of an earlier draft that read, quote, the wine shall likewise be consumed or reverently poured upon untrodden ground. Now this is extremely serious because this is basically a sacrilege. Pouring out the consecrated wine is a sacrilege. We should also note that the original draft of this 2019 book was fully orthodox in faith and practice and followed the prayer book tradition completely. That original version read, Apart from that which is to be reserved, the priest or deacon and other communicants shall reverently consume the remaining consecrated bread and wine, either after the ministration of communion or after the dismissal. So somewhere that got changed. I didn't even realize that it had been changed until the final copy was prepared and it needs to be changed back. I urge that this correction be made before final approval by the ACNA Provincial Assembly this June. In my opinion, no Anglican in good conscience can vote to approve this prayer book while it has a rubric that condones disposing of the sacrament in a sacrilegious manner. And I urge that every delegate and bishop vote against it until that correction is made. Perhaps even a disciplinary canon or code of practice could be introduced as well to ensure the reverent and proper handling of sacred materials. We need to get it right this time, and we cannot afford to wait 50 or 100 years until the next revision to fix the problem. Now some of you may be wondering, why is this such a serious matter? And that's understandable, because a lot of people don't really know the rules about this, and also because it's a common misunderstanding, and frankly a common liturgical abuse in our day. And also because the way the altar linens are properly handled can lead someone to think that this would be the way to handle leftover consecrated wine. In fact, for those who have served on an altar guild, you know very well that the linens get stained after administering the chalice, especially in churches where red wine is employed for Holy Communion. And so the first thing is that the stained linens are soaked in water to dilute and remove any of the remaining consecrated wine. And that water is then poured into what we call the sacrarium, or down the piscina, or outside the church is reverently poured onto the ground. 
Now I've introduced some terms there. What do those terms mean? Well, if we pull up this book, Anglican Services, there's a nice little handy glossary in the back, and that will give us a definition of piscina. It says, a drain leading to clean earth alone, into which liquids which have been used for sacred purposes may reverently be poured for disposal. So basically we're talking about a sink, but it doesn't go empty into the sewer system, it empties onto the ground. And as far as what a piscina is, there's also additional uh, information and ritual notes. And basically what we're talking about here is kind of like a well, but there's no water in it. It doesn't go down very deep. It's just a walled enclosure so that this sacred untrodden ground is set apart and won't be disturbed. So what we're talking about here is basically a sink in the sacristy that unlike a regular sink, doesn't empty into the sewer system, but it empties directly onto the ground. And historically that ground was in within a walled enclosure called a sacrarium and protected it from being disturbed. Now, let's ask the question, what goes into the piscina? And the answer is only water and blessed salt and ashes. Holy Communion is never poured into the piscina. And this is standard practice across Anglican, Catholic, and Orthodox churches. Anybody who has a piscina and a sacrarium. The sacrarium is for water. When the water and the linens have been soaked and is poured out, that is water, not the precious blood. It's common teaching across Anglican, Catholic, and Orthodox churches that the real presence persists until what we call the destruction of the species, that is, until it no longer has the outward appearances of bread and wine. Now, this question about the piscina and the precious blood was addressed in one of these books, the liturgical question box, which answers all these kinds of odds and ends questions like this. And on page 122, for example, it poses the question, could the contents of the chalices be poured down the sacrarium? Basically, if you had a lot left over. And so he answers, while it could be argued that pouring the blood of Christ down the sacrarium is more reverent than using a common drain, it is not permitted to dispose of the contents of the chalice in this way. The remaining blood of Christ is to be consumed, just as any hosts in the tabernacle are destined to be consumed. So that's what you're supposed to do with it. Now you might say, well, maybe that's just a Catholic thing. I mean, that was a Catholic question and answer book. Well, none of these Anglican resources say anything about pouring the precious blood down the sacrarium or piscina. You've got the priest handbook by Michno. You've got uh, prayer book rubrics expanded and explained. You've got ceremonies of the Eucharist. None of them say anything about pouring the precious blood into the piscina, basically because you already had a direction that everything, that everything was supposed to be consumed. That's what all of the prayer books had prescribed. We're obligated to treat the Blessed Sacrament with the highest degree of reverence. And here, that means reverently consuming the precious blood that remains after Holy Communion. Now, the rubric of the 1662 English prayer book is very explicit and it has basically been followed in every prayer book throughout the Anglican Communion so far. It directs that for the unreserved consecrated elements that remain, quote, the priest and such other of the communicants as he shall then call unto him, shall, immediately after the blessing, reverently eat and drink the same. It's interesting that an ecumenical theological study from the Church of England titled Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry Observed, quote, this provision for reverent consumption has helped to hold in unity worshipers with a variety of understandings of Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Contrast that with the rubric in the proposed Book of 2019. It is a drastic departure from Anglican practice. Now, one might argue, ironically, that the rubric of the proposed 2019 prayer book is accurate in the sense that the consecrated wine may be poured, quote, in a place set aside for that purpose. But that is grossly misleading, because the only place ever designated for that purpose in all of Christian tradition, East and West, is the throat of a baptized believer. 
that would be treating the sacrament with fitting reverence. But I think most people will have in mind what the earlier draft stated, pouring it onto untrodden ground, which is where the piscina leads to. And again, that practice is a sacrilege, and that's why it needs to be changed. Now we've seen the directions in the historic prayer books. What about other Christians? Well, I was told by an Eastern Orthodox priest that the reason why many of their churches have small, multiple small rugs or carpets on the Ambon area where the people receive communion is that if the body and blood were to fall onto the floor, then that rug could be taken out, easily removed, and burnt. And then the ashes would be put into this aquarium. To further illustrate the gravity of the situation, this type of thing is explicitly forbidden by canon law in the Roman Catholic Church and given the most severe penalty. Canon 1367 says, a person who throws away the consecrated species or takes them or retains them for sacrilegious purpose incurs an automatic excommunication reserved to the apostolic see. If a cleric, he can be punished with another penalty, including dismissal from the clerical state. So that canon used the term throws away. Does that include pouring the consecrated wine into the piscina? Well, thankfully, someone asked the question, and the official instruction on this matter from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in their document Redemptionis Sacramentum further explained and clarified, to be regarded as pertaining to this case is any action that is voluntary and gravely disrespectful of the sacred species Anyone, therefore, who acts contrary to these norms, for example, casting the sacred species into the aquarium, or into an unworthy place, or on the ground, incurs the penalties laid down. So, there you have it. And the Roman Church, if you willingly and knowingly pour the consecrated wine down the piscina, you are automatically excommunicated, and only the Pope himself can lift that excommunication. And if you're a cleric, you can be defrocked for doing so. So it is indeed a very serious matter. The Blessed Sacrament should be treated and handled with great reverence. Should we Anglicans treat the sacrament with any less regard? Think of all those Anglican divines who have testified to our Lord in the sacrament through the last 450 years of our spiritual heritage. What would those saints do? Consider the private devotions of Lancelot Andrews, who served successively as the Anglican Bishop of Chichester, of Ely, and of Winchester, and then oversaw the translation of the King James Bible. One of his prayers goes like this, Lord, I am not worthy, I am not fit that thou shouldst come under the defiled roof of my soul, for it is all desolate and ruined nor hast thou in me a fitting place to lay thy head. But as thou didst condescend to lie in the cavern and manger of brute cattle, as thou didst not refuse to be entertained in the house of Simon the leper, as thou didst not disdain the harlot, a sinner like me, when she came unto thee and touched thee, and as thou abhorrest not her polluted and loathsome mouth, nor the thief upon the cross confessing thee, so even me, the ruined, wretched, excessive sinner, deign to receive to the touch and the partaking of the immaculate, supernatural, life-giving, and saving mysteries of thy all-holy body and thy precious blood. Does that sound like someone who would ever dare pour that same communion wine out into the piscina? And it's hard to read through, for example, the homily on the worthy receiving and reverend esteeming of the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in the second book of homilies, and imagine that any Anglican of any era would do such a thing. In the third century, Tertullian wrote, quote, We feel pained should any wine or bread, even though our own, be cast upon the ground. And he was talking about non-consecrated bread and wine, our own. Imagine what the early Christians would have thought 
about consecrated bread and wine being cast to the ground. From the early church, St. Tarsicius is often looked to as kind of a patron saint for those making their first communion, because his example of faith as a young acolyte taking communion to prisoners and then giving up his life protecting the sacrament is an inspiration. But I want to close with another, more recent model of faith, the story of Little Lee, as Bishop Sheen liked to tell it. Chinese nationalists in the Boxer Rebellion of 1900 viewed Christianity as a symbol of Western colonialism, so Chinese soldiers were ordered to destroy Catholic churches across the country. They broke in, they took tabernacles and sacred vessels, and imprisoned priests. And there was one church in the Chinese countryside that was destroyed in such a way, while a small girl named Li hid in the back. She watched as the priest was arrested, as the tabernacle was torn away, and the sacred hosts were strewn across the floor. The girl saw where they landed, and noticed that the soldiers just walked over and walked by, never bothered to pick it up or straighten it up. She went back to her home that afternoon and told her parents what she had seen. Now, she had been a daily communicant since making her first communion, not too long before, and she had taken to the devotion of the holy hour, as instructed by her parish priest. And that night, slipping past guards and police officers, she snuck back into the church, knelt before the discarded hosts, made her holy hour as she had done every day, and after that time in prayer, she consumed one of the hosts, which was the rule, only one communion per day, and then secretly went back home. Thirty-two hosts had been strewn across the floor, and so for thirty-two consecutive nights, under the cover of darkness, this young girl risked her life and went back to the church, spending time first in prayer and worship, and one by one she consumed the Holy Eucharist. On the last night, after the girl had received Holy Communion, the last one, she accidentally woke up a sleeping guard who chased her down and beat her to death. The parish priest under house arrest, but watching from his window, stood by helplessly as that girl, little Lee, became a martyr. May we all show such love and devotion to our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And so I'm asking, please, 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 unless and until this rubric is changed, vote no to the proposed ACNA prayer book at the Provincial Assembly in June. Frankly, if you can fix a typo, you can surely fix this. We need to get this right. I'm Father Timothy Matkin. I thank you for listening. Oh,